Councilors, please take your seats. All right, welcome everyone. I'd like to call to order the uh, March 22nd, 2018 joint workshop on marijuana with the Town Council and the Board of Health. Uh, Madam Clerk, or actually, I gotta read this little note too. Uh, please note that in tonight's meeting is recorded and broadcast on channel 18, that in accordance with Mass General Law, chapter 38, section 20, I must inquire whether anyone is recording this meeting, and if so, to please make their presence known. Seeing none, please silence your devices. Madam Clerk, may we have the roll call. Councilors? Friedenbender? Present. Crocker? Present. Cullum? Dagwan? Present. Flores? Here. Rap Corsetti? Present. Hebert? Le Levesque? Here. Neary? Here. Schnepp? Here. Steinhilber? Here. Tinsley? Here. Wallace? Here. We have four. Do you want me to do the Board of Health? Yes, please. Board of Health? Caniff? Here. Soyanagi? I believe he's on his way. And I want to welcome our chair of the Board of Health, Paul Caniff, uh, here with us tonight. And I want to welcome all of our panelists for being here as well. I really appreciate your time. Um, would everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance in a moment of silence. So this is a workshop format. It's a little different than our, our regular meetings. Some of us decide not to wear ties, and that's okay. No, just kidding. <laughs> a little bit more casual. <laughs> uh, but it was an opportunity. It's obviously a big issue facing um, all the communities in Massachusetts, and I thought it was a good opportunity for us to get together and uh, to have a chance to uh, learn the issue, a chance for some more education, and a chance for uh, Q&A with you know, various uh, professionals that um, taking time to be with us here tonight. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to our moderator, uh, Maureen O'Shea. Uh, she's a research and strategy professional and uh, volunteer, and she's from uh, Cape Cod Community College. So welcome, Maureen, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, good evening, welcome to all for coming. Um, my name's Maureen O'Shea. I live and work in West Barnstable and volunteer in a number of, number of capacities. I'm happy to serve as your moderator this evening. Currently, the town of Barnstable has a moratorium on recreational marijuana, which is in place until December 31st, 2018. The town council needs to contemplate regulating or banning the sale of recreational marijuana after the moratorium ends. We'll he we will hear an overview of the regulations from our town attorney, Ruth Wheel, and a consideration of the financial tax impacts from Mark Milne, town finance director. Then a panel will feature a number of speakers followed by questions from the members of the town council and the Board of Health. This is the beginning of the community conversation. Um, Ruth, would you like to begin? Good evening, counselors. Pleasure to be here. Um, just as opening proviso, I have gone to a number of seminars that have lasted all day in a uh, subject that I'm going to cover in five minutes. So this is not even a thumbnail sketch. It's like a pinky nail sketch. And I want a, so there's a lot more information that's available. I have um, put out and put in your folders copies of the latest guidance from the Cannabis Control Commission, a new acronym, CCC. And that's the latest information from that body. And there's a lot of information that we can provide. So this is just an overview to frame the discussion of our esteemed panel. It is not meant to be you know, definitive study of the law, et cetera. So I just want everybody to be aware of that. Um, the timeline for implementation of the marijuana for adult use. Um, as everybody knows, November 8th was the uh, 2016 
Question 4 passed statewide by a majority, but was defeated in the town of Barnstable by a vote of 12,432 yes and 13,463 no. That the significance of that vote will become clear later on because there's different regulatory functions if you voted yes and no. So that's an important um, uh, date. Uh, that's an important vote for as we go forward. Uh, April 27, 2017, uh, this council um, put in place the temporary moratorium, which is in effect until December 31st of 2018. The governor revised the petition article and the, uh, signed the petition, the legislation which revised the initial petition article, which had some ambiguities, which the legislature felt needed to be um, corrected uh, or amplified. And there is just so uh, to talk about the shifting sands of this um, issue, Governor Baker has further legislation that's pending before the legislature to clarify several other points. So this is an area that's evolving even a, as we speak. Um, the Cannabis Control Board was appointed in August, and then the CCC was appointed in September. There are draft regs that um, were finalized on May um, 7, uh, uh, March 7th of 2018. And on March 23rd, which is tomorrow, they're hoping to have them published. So this is evolving, and the Cannabis Control Commission can take applications um, starting April 1st, but there are many steps um, before an application be can be submitted, and um, one would not be eligible in the town of Barnesville for reasons I'm going to indicate. Just to give you the types of licensed marijuana establishments that are regulated under the, the state law and regulations, there are ma ma marijuana cultivators, there are marijuana, marijuana product manufacturers, marijuana retailers, marijuana transporters, marijuana research facilities, laboratories, micro-businesses, and the social consumption delivery was delayed in the regulations, so that's not the subject for regulation at this time. So this is really the crux of our discussion tonight. What are the legislative options? Um, a, com a complete ban of marijuana establishments, the list that we just went through, for adult use um, it can be allowed. And because Barnstable voted against question four, um, the town council can adopt a complete ban without having to go to the ballot. Those communities that voted yes um, are, are engaged in a two-step process. First, the legislative body has to approve a ban, and then um, it has to go to the ballot at either a town election or a special election. This um, ban is only available until December 31st, 2019. If that does not take place, then um, the towns will be precluded, municipal municipalities will be precluded from banning it. The Attorney General's office recommends with any zoning ordinance, with any ordinance involving um, this recreational marijuana or adult use marijuana that you pass both a zoning and a general ordinance. If you only want to do one, it, it has to be a zoning ordinance because this is land use based. But the recommendation is to, bo to, to do both. So the second option is rather than a, an absolute ban is to limit the number of marijuana establishments rather than institute a complete ban. And you can limit the number um, to fewer than 20%. 20% in the town of Barnesville last time I checked with our licensing um, authority would be a five. But if we decide, if the town of Barnesville's legislative body, the town council decides to do less, they can do so by a zoning enactment. Um, they can also it, prohibit the type of marijuana establishments. And they can also limit the number of any type of marijuana establishments to fewer than the number of medical marijuana treatment centers registered in the municipality. Um, medical marijuana is not covered in this discussion. It will transition from the Department of Public Health to the CCC eventually, but um, we have our medical marijuana ordinance in place and that we're not gonna discuss that. Again, these options are only available until December 31st, 2019. If we choose local regulation, there are general provisions um, that we can regulate. We can re regulate the time, place, and manner of marijuana establishment operations. We can impose reasonable safeguards on such operations, provided that such ordinances do not render operations unreasonably impracticable. 
and that's, I'm sure, going to be a word that's going to be subject to litigation <laughs> at some point in time. Uh, we can restrict uh, the license cultivation, processing, and manufacturing of marijuana, that is, uh, which we deem a public nuisance. And you can es establish restrictions on public signs related to marijuana establishments. Um, we can establish civil pen penalties for violation of an ordinance. Um, as in all, the standard practice for the adoption of, of a zoning ordinance would apply. So we would either regulate it in a current zoning district or we can do an overlay like we did with the medical marijuana. Uh, a lot of communities are just uh, tucking these establishments in, in their existing zoning districts, but we have the choice of doing either one. Um, we can establish local licensing procedures as long as they, um, are those requirements do not um, conflict with state law. I saw the, this uh, town of Brookline has extensive licensing, proce licensing procedures that are, it's cur that are currently before town meeting. So you could have a separate local licensing process if the town chose to do that under a general bylaw. Um, but we can't bar transportation of marijuana or marijuana products. That's specific in the legislation. Um, just as an example of the types of regulations that may be contained in ordinances, you can have buffer zones. Under the state law, the marijuana establishment may not be located with 500 feet of a pre-existing public or private school providing education from kindergarten or grades one through 12. Municipalities may adopt an ordinance uh, to reduce that distance um, requirement, but we can inc increase it beyond the 500 feet. The signage, we may regulate uh, by ordinance signage regarding marijuana related uses, but the ordinance may not impose a standard more restrictive than applied to retail establishments selling alcohol beverages within the municipality. Hours of operation, we can reasonably control those hours of operation security. We can impose um, regulations that a security plan will be, will be reviewed by public safety officials. The agricultural exemption, this came up in the discussion and it was clarified. The normal exemption under Chapter 48, Section 3 um, for agricultural does not apply to marijuana. We can regulate it in another way if we cho choose to, but it's not legally exempt the way other agricultural uses are. I'm just, I'm, this is just a note, what we can't regulate. Um, personal use has an exemption. It can't be subject to municipal regulation. I've list, uh, listed what is permitted and then there are restrictions on what's permitted, but that is not subject to municipal regulation, personal use, except where there's law enforcement elements if you don't comply with the requirements uh, of the law. Um, and finally, um, if the town allows marijuana establishments, the Cannabis Control Commission is required by law to engage in a licensing process for marijuana establishments. During the application process, applicants will be required to demonstrate that they have a community outreach meeting within the past six months, that they have executed a host agreement with the municipality. Once the application is complete, the uh, mun municipality will be notified and given an opportunity to confirm th that the proposed location is compliant with local ordinances and regulations and the application has been completed and there's a host agreement. Um, and that's my presentation. Um, Mark Milne is gonna talk about host agreements and other aspects of the law. And I'm willing to ask some questions now. We'll wait till, till the end. So why don't we get through maybe yeah. you and Mark and then we can well, let's just get through the presentations and then we'll do a Q&A session. Good evening, nice to see you all this, e this evening. Mark Milne, uh, Director of Finance for the Town of Barnstable. Uh, let me just preface my remarks tonight first by stating that we have not fully developed the cost of um, regulating, enforcing, educating, as well as other costs um, of such a program for the Town of Barnstable. Um, that has not been fully developed. I'm only going to speak tonight in regards to the revenue opportunities uh, presented by or that are included in this law um, that uh, that is before that we're discussing tonight. As soon as uh, Lynn gets that up, we'll start.
sorry about that. Um, so, Chapter 64N, Section 3 of the general law allows for the community to adopt a local sales tax um, for this, uh, under this program. So, um, to give you an example of, um, of what that might look like for the town of Barnstable, Colorado has had a recreational marijuana uh, law in place for a number of years now, since 2014. Um, their program, ha their retail sales levels have uh, doubled in the past four years to almost $1.5 billion statewide. Um, looking at the Eagle County, Colorado, which has a similar population to Barnstable of about 54,000 people, um, it is, has a high seasonal fluctuation as it includes the destination resorts of Val and Beaver Creek. Um, they generate about $14 million a year in recreational sales, uh, which equates to at a 3% tax rate, would, e would, e would be equivalent of about $415,000 of tax revenue um, that could be generated with, with under that 3% rate. Um, some of the other, is that not working, Lynn? Could you go to the next page? Some of the other components of the, um, of the law include a host agreement. The host agreement um, allows for the community to um, implement a, uh, um, an agreement that allow up to 3% of the retail sales um, of uh, the organization. And that agreement can last for up to five years. Um, and that's it. Beyond, after five years, it, it expires. And so um, the host agreement is the second opportunity for, for income for the town. Again, though, however, it has a sunset clause built into it. Um, the third component, of, I think Ruth mentioned earlier tonight, was that um, you can adopt civil penalties, um, similar to the civil penalties that we have in place for alcoholic beverages. Um, and finally, there's a fourth component. Um, there is a uh, state fund that all the state revenue generated by this program goes into this fund and after covering all the costs that the state incurs for regulating, enforcing, licensing um, such operations, if there's money left over, they will do revenue sharing with the local communities in the forms of uh, grants for school systems as well as uh, law enforcement and police training. Um, so those are the major four major revenue component opportunities for the town under such a program. Um, of course, there are other opportunities, things like um, employment, what, and we haven't fully developed what the employment opportunities for the town would look like um, and how that might have a financial impact on the town as well. So um, just looking at the tax and host agreement opportunities, those are what are before us under this law. Thank you. Thank you. Luckily, I'm not using a PowerPoint. <laughs> okay. Um, Ma Maureen, maybe we could just shift gears. Uh, sure. I'm just thinking because um, Do you want to once we get questions? through everyone, that's going to be a lot. So maybe if there's any questions for Ruth or Mark, um, just in a timely fashion, it goes if you have any questions, and then we'll get into the panel. Any counselors have any questions at this time? Councilor Biedenbender? Hey there. Um, my questions are for Mark. Um, I have two questions, um, and it's just a to confirm that I'm hearing correctly. So the first one was at five years, uh, the, the host agreement expires. Does that mean there is no more revenue that can come to the town from those establishments after that five years? Um, in the form of a host agreement, yes, that's correct. The, the, once it expires, we can't charge anything anymore uh, to that. Um, I think the assumption is that the tax will take over the responsibility of covering the cost of enforcement uh, regulation and so forth. Okay. And then the second question is, I, I'm assuming this is the case, but I just want to be absolutely clear that in regards to the revenue sharing from the state, um, you, you must be a participating community, obviously, right, in order to revenue yes. share? Okay. Yes. Thanks. Councillor Tinsley? Sorry, Mark, this one was for you too. <laughs> It, it, and I'm, I'm staying with the host community agreement because I, I just some of the information we got, a, a lot of us went to the meetings up at MMA uh, to deal with this. 
and it said the act does not preclude renegotiation of a host agreement at the end of the initial five-year term. So that means we could renegotiate and get that three up to 3% again, correct? Yeah, I think if you're capped at 3% of the sales, so if, if the host agreement did not recoup 3% of those sales um, dollars within that first five years, then perhaps you can renegotiate to get up to that 3% of the sales. But the other key point of this is that we have to document all costs associated with that host agreement, which is a public document, so we have to be able to verify and prove that we've incurred these costs. Any other counselors? Vice President Crocker? I'm sorry, Mark, you're the man. Um, by documenting it, it, it's, it, it sounds like it's 3% uh, of, um, of a fund, but reality is we're documenting money that we spend, so we're just recapturing what we spent. Exactly. So yes, there is no surplus there of 3% like it is in For some the of the other taxes. That's correct. And when we're back to the first base tax of 3%, is there any uh, state revenue sharing with that? How much of that really returns directly to the town? Yeah, the 3% the base tax comes back to the town 100%. The, I believe the state charges a 10% tax. That goes into that state fund, and that could potentially become some revenue sharing for A us. different way back to us if, yes. if the formulas ever were in our interest. Huh? Yes. But Another uh, interesting <laughs> component about the 3% that I forgot to mention was that in the uh, the Acts of uh, 2017, Chapter 55, the Cannabis Control Commission is, has been charged with looking at alternative basis for calculating that tax other than sales. It could be based on volume, um, weight, and THC level as well. So we could theoretically be moved off a sales tax based on the level of sales. It could be based on some other component, the tax itself. You're referring to the 3% that the 3 is, comes back to our community may right. be moved around as opposed to a dollar sales figure, which the state would stay on. Yes. Hmm. Even more questionable. Thank you. Any other counselors? No? Nope. All right. Thank you, uh, Maureen, for shifting gears there. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Okay. So I'd like to introduce the panel. Um, each panelist will speak for no more than 10 minutes, so I'll give you a two-minute warning. Um, at the end of all the panelists' presentations, members of the Town Council and the Board of Health may address questions to the panelists. Questions from the general public will not be heard at this time. Okay. Henri Raschenbach is a consultant and lobbyist representing significant interests in healthcare and energy. He has also been involved in the implementation of medical marijuana, but is not currently representing any recreational or med medical interests right now. Michael O'Keefe. Cape and Islands District Attorney has been prosecuting cases for over 30 years, including over 250 jury trials and 19 homicide trials. He has represented the Commonwealth before the Massachusetts Appeals Court and the Supreme Judicial Court. Mr. O'Keefe was a member of the Federal S State Anti-Terrorism Task Force. I thought I had that off. Okay. The the, an executive board member of the Workforce Investment Board's Youth Council and a member of the Attorney General's Racial Profiling Task Force. Mr. O'Keefe has also been working toward combating the opiate crisis through innovative early prevention, education, and treatment programs. Okay. William Luzier graduated from the New England School of Law and has served as Assistant Attorney General and Division Chief in the Criminal Bureau of the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office. Chief of Staff and General Counsel to Senators Warren and Stephen Tolman, and Executive Director of the Governor's Interagency Council on Substance Abuse and Prevention. In 2015, he was named Campaign Manager of Yes on Four to Tax and Regulate Marijuana, sponsored by the Marijuana Policy Project, a successful ballot initiative in November 2016. He now serves as the Political Director of the Marijuana Policy Project of Massachusetts. <laughs> Lieutenant John Murphy, Barnstable Police Department, has been employed full-time in law enforcement for over 35 years. He was a special agent with the FBI from 1996 to 2002 and assigned to Newark, New Jersey and the 9-11 Attack Task Force. He has been involved with hundreds of narcotics-related investigations and arrests, including testifying in district, superior, and federal court. Lieutenant Murphy has worked on Cape Cod narcotics investigations with all the Cape Police Departments, Barnstable Sheriff's Department, 
Mass State Police, and the DEA. Spencer Knowles, RegulateCapeCod.org co-founder, has spent his career marketing and selling fine wine, both in retail and wholesale distribution. A 12th generation Cape Codder, Spencer's family still owns and operates a business in Orleans. With the recent legalization of cannabis in the Commonwealth, Spencer feels strongly that the Cape Cod should take a leadership role in providing a safe and regulated path for the legal cannabis market. Stephanie Ellis is the current vice chair of the Barnstable School Committee with three children in the school system. She was recently elected for her third term and has been on the committee for nine years. She has a master's degree in nursing and has worked for Cape Cod Healthcare for over 20 years. Currently, she, she is a family nurse practitioner and works per diem in the emergency room. For the past 12 years, she has been certified as a sexual assault nurse examiner and provides forensic nursing care for Cape Cod Hospital and Falmouth Hospital. Thank you all for your time and expertise. Okay. Um, and one final instruction, please speak into the mic. <laughs> um, Mr. Rauschenbach, would you like to get us started? Uh, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to come and talk at you for a little bit. Um, ostensibly, I'm going to just talk uh, a little bit about um, why would a community want to be a host? Uh, why would they want to open it up? Uh, the Cape is kind of an interesting thing when you look. 91 or so towns across the Commonwealth voted against uh, this, even though it was a fairly narrow vote. Uh, if you look at the Cape, it's everything from the bridge to East Ham. So it's quite a swath of towns that voted against it. So there are a variety of towns that are in the same situation as you are that are struggling with this. You know, Bourne has got a lot going on. Do they want to open up or not? I think some of the operative thoughts on it, other than getting to the revenue side and as the uh, sort of great inducer, uh, is the fact that this law opens up for the individual and up to two individuals and a primary residence to grow up to 12 plants. It's a fairly significant amount. It allows for a little bit of that to be sold. It sort of takes the structure that's inherent with medical marijuana and that potentially would be inherent with recreational marijuana, the oversight, the enforcement, uh, the role of public health and the quality of the product, and it disperses it across a community for anybody that wants to grow individually, lock the closet door, put heat lamps in there, whatever it is, or grow lamps, whatever's going to uh, grow it. Uh, and there's a, a fair amount of concern that this pushes the general population uh, to an extreme that maybe communities really don't want, particularly larger communities, because that is infinitely more difficult to regulate than five stores or six stores in the case of Barnstable. You know, on the, the host agreement side, uh, you know, five years, uh, communities like Worcester have, you know, negotiated host agreements, 450000 a year. You know, for their 3%, they're much bigger. DPH estimates that an individual store would generate about seven million per store. Uh, and that's based on, you know, a circumference of like 49,500, which is basically Barnstable, but if you added five stores, how much would that be? You know, 3% in the tax and then 3% host, 6%. Uh, could that roll up in the case of Barnstable like a million and a half or two? There are studies that have been done on the expense side saying, looking at a variety of states that uh, have implemented this Colorado, you don't necessarily see that much increased expense on the law enforcement side. Uh, on the school side, you don't necessarily see that much of an increase with youth in Colorado. They've showed that actually the uh, the experience of the individual youth in school has decreased from a smoking point of view. Um, all these things sort of factor into decision that you as policymakers would have to make uh, in this community. The most interesting thing about the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, as you look at the evolution of this bill, you have a ballot question which is roundly changed by the legislature. The governor has weighted in and wants more changes 
you now have DPH regulating and the Cannabis Commission regulating. You have two regulating authorities saying, we'll work this out. DPH is going to wander out of the picture uh, shortly, but for the near term and this licensing process, DPH can't, you know, put anything on top unless it's new that they haven't done before, and then the Cannabis Commission is rolling out their regs, all subject to change. You know, but like any tax uh, that's going to, or sunset, uh, the fact is that within reason you may very well find three years from now or four years from now communities saying, uh, let's not let this 3% host agreement, uh, let's not let that sunset, because uh, that's a critical uh, source of, of uh, dollars for cities and towns to uh, enforce, grow, work with the schools, public education, public health. Um, so the fact that it appears to be there, that of course it may, it may carry on, <laughs> um, you know, beyond, its, uh, beyond its, its time, so as we know it now. So this is a, a movable feast, really, and it's going to change a lot. And uh, the legislature has a, uh, a committee that deals just with marijuana. And in situations like that, with an activist legislature, you'll find that there'll be a lot of issues that'll be up there before them. There'll be changes that'll continually happen in this bill. And as it is rolled out and you start hitting these benchmarks, I think you'll see a fairly serious debate about the financing part of it. Of course, it's not just the host agreement, et cetera, uh, that should be of interest to the towns. Uh, there are a number of communities that are working with uh, the grower or the retailer and, you know, local law enforcement and the schools, there's potential for real synergy there. And then there's the jobs that ostensibly uh, are associated with this, you know, year-round jobs that uh, will pay well. A lot of folks that are trained in, in sort of agronomy, uh, agriculture, uh, you know, the impact of that on local schools and whatnot from a training point of view. Uh, electricians, HVAC folks, there's a whole subset of infrastructure and in communities that is going to be lifted up by uh, this kind of uh, new business in town. So I'll stop there. Uh, it's an intriguing situation, I think, that you find yourselves in. You've got a majority, ostensibly, that voted against it, but it was fairly narrow. But you've got all these considerations. Do you hang in there and not do much while all around you communities react? Uh, you'll have, uh, you know, Bourne is reacting, Mashpee. Uh, Brewster is going to have a, uh, a spot right there off of uh, uh, the Mid-Cape. And as that closes in around you, uh, have you made a good decision to stay out of it as long as you can, or should you embrace it? So good luck. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Key, you, you stay there or come on up either way. He started it. <laughs> yep. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm sure it'll come as no surprise to any of you that I was against uh, this ballot question and fought along with uh, every other district attorney across the Commonwealth against it, as did Governor Baker, the Attorney General, and uh, everybody, everybody in the health community, because this is a bad idea. It's a bad idea primarily for our youth. Um, just because one can do something doesn't mean they should. And I would respectfully urge you to take the most narrow view of this that you can. And that would be to join the majority of the other 351 cities and towns in the Commonwealth who have already said no to this in one form or another. Some have banned it outright, some have created very narrow zoning, 
Uh, but the majority of towns and cities have said no. It's very interesting. This is, a, you know, one of the things the governor said many times during this, and that the district attorneys said as well, is that people may be in favor of the concept of, you know, legalizing marijuana because they were sold this bill of goods that, you know, people were being prosecuted and put in jail and all of this stuff. Nobody has gone to jail for marijuana possession in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts since way before 2008 when we decriminalized ma marijuana up to an ounce on the same sophistry that people were going to jail. Everybody was entitled to a continuance without a finding. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's the police, you know, find you in possession of marijuana. This is way back in the 90s. And they brought you into court and you were, con you were, you were entitled under the law to a continuance without a finding. Don't do it again, six months, the case disappears. You have no record. You have no and, you know, I I've said a thousand times in the last few years, I don't really care if some 30-year-old engineer who's making 350 grand working for Wang out and living in Weston goes home at night and has a joint. Who cares? That person has been a success in life. They've made it. They're doing fine. If they want to go home and have a joint, fine. N the Weston police, believe me, weren't after that person. But we were sold this bill of goods that people were languishing in jail for possession of marijuana, so we have to legalize it. But what buyer's remorse we must be experiencing for the majority of the 351 cities and towns to have outlawed this in either one step or another. Uh, it, you know, really, it, it boggles the mind why we would want to introduce another intoxicant to our youth. And make no mistake, and I have to disagree with my friend Henri, marijuana use among youth goes up dramatically under these laws. That's the experience of Colorado. And it, you know, you can go on the internet and look at the data for yourself. Don't take my word for it. The Cannabis Control Commission was persuaded to not go into right away things like on-site consumption and mixed use. In other words, mixed use, the idea of selling pot-infused brownies and candies at the local movie theater. Now, who works at the local movie theater? Kids. And, but then the, the argument was, well, there'll be, a, there'll be a firewall between, I guess, the good and plenties that don't have any pot in them and the pot brownies and the good and plenties that do, and we'll make sure that kids stay away from the stuff that does have the pot in it at the local movie theater where they're working. And then, of course, we, had, we have home delivery of marijuana. And that was also at the urging of the governor, though it was in the first draft regulations that the Cannabis Control Commission put out, that was going to be okayed. And so they've only delayed those things for a year. And the compromise was, okay, we'll, the Cannabis Control Commission will delay them for a year, but a, a year from now, when we do them, when we give out these licenses for home delivery, we're going to award them on the basis of the criminals who were convicted. They're going to get the first crack at the license. I mean, it's really, some of this stuff is, it's hard to believe. So, uh, you know, we have to respect the will of the voters of the Commonwealth who gave us this. But let's also respect the will of the voters on the Cape, who but for Provincetown, Truro, Wellfleet, and East Ham said, we don't want this. You have the opportunity to put the brakes on this 
if not ban it outright, and at least wait and see what the experience is around the Commonwealth with people that are driving under the influence of marijuana. The police have no ability really at all to deal with those people, and I have no ability to prosecute them. And the reason, of course, is while we have a whole sort of panoply to deal with driving under the influence of alcohol, and that problem is bad enough, <clears throat> the reason that we have things like the breathalyzer machine and other devices that will allow us to measure the amount of alcohol in somebody's blood and correlate that to a loss of function, cognitive ability, motor control, is because numerous studies over many, many years have been done on humans in order to make that correlation. What amount of alcohol in the blood makes you unable to be a safe driver? But we haven't been able to do that with marijuana. Why? It's been illegal. And no scientific entity is going to be experimenting on humans with this illegal substance. And respectfully, ladies and gentlemen, it is still illegal. And we have a new sort of directive, if you will, from the Attorney General of the United States that it's going to remain illegal. And that has several consequences that I would ask you to really give some thought to, that it's gonna remain essentially a cash business, which comes with its own set of difficulties. And, and so, you know, think about all of these things and the unattended consequences of going down this road at a point where we simply don't have the data yet to determine how it's going to impact the primary group of folks that I'm concerned about, and that is the youth in our communities. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. President, members of the Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this evening. Um, with the aptly named joint hearing on uh, marijuana issues. Um, my name is Will Luzier. I was the campaign manager for question four. Um, and uh, I work for the Marijuana Policy Project. The Marijuana Policy Project is an organization out of Washington, D.C. that has been working on marijuana law reform for the last 21 years. They uh, sponsored the initiative in Colorado and Alaska and sponsored the initiative uh, in 2016 in Maine, Massachusetts, uh, Nevada, Arizona, and worked closely with the Drug Policy Alliance in, Cal in California. <coughs> if the town of Barnstable outlaws cannabis, only outlaws will sell cannabis in Barnstable. Creating a cannabis desert on the Cape will make, a prime, will make the Cape a prime target for drug dealers who have more harmful drugs to sell than cannabis. Take that market away from violent, violent gangs and drug dealers and open up a taxed and regulated market where the products are tested, customers know exactly what they are buying, and ideas, IDs are checked at the door. Remember that illicit, illicit drug dealers don't ask for IDs. There are an estimated, there, it's estimated that there are a million cannabis users in Massachusetts, and believe it or not, some of them live right here in the town of Barnstable, and many more visit Barnstable on occasion. Those folks are going to spend money in Bar Barnstable, or they're going to spend their money elsewhere or on the illicit market. So you can opt to take advantage of that market or reject it. Let's talk about taxes for a minute. A local option tax of 3% and an additional 3% local host agreement adds up to 6%. The average annual sale at a current RMD is approximately $7 million, but that's just medical. Let's estimate annual adult use sales conservatively per retail outlet at $10 million. A single retail out outlet would therefore generate $600,000. Two would generate $1.2 million. 
and that's just the sales tax. Other taxes, such as real estate taxes, could yield additional revenue for the town. This new commerce will also create jobs. The town of Barnstable will have cons significant control over the location, time of operation, manner of operation, and signage for this commerce. Establishments are required to show that they have executed the local host agreement, which has been mentioned, with the locality, and held a public meeting in the locality with the Butters and any other interested parties. A municipality may also implement its own licensing process as long as it doesn't conflict with state laws or regulations governing marijuana establishments. We all know that the elephant in the room here on the Cape is opiate abuse. And you may hear from some that cannabis use le leads to opiate abuse. There is no reliable science that supports this notion. In fact, there is a developing body of scientific evidence that cannabis reduces the abuse of opiates. Cannabis may be associated with opiates only because drug pushers may have both to offer with opiates providing a more consistent revenue. There are strong protections against youth use in the regulations issued by the Cannabis Control Commission, and no one is more emphatic about preventing youth use than us. Assuring that customers are of appropriate age is a primary concern for, for commercial cannabis lest they jeopardize their investment by a suspension or loss of license. Certainly impaired driving is a concern and the legislature has mandated a task force to report on all aspects of impaired driving. In the meantime, there is funding mandated in the legislation for training of law enforcement to increase the number of drug recognition experts available to assess impaired driving. Furthermore, a recent study of traffic fatalities in Colorado and Washington released by the National Bureau of Economic Research in Cambridge found little evidence that the total rate of traffic fatalities has increased significantly as a consequence of recreational marijuana legalization. In conclusion, the adult use of cannabis in Massachusetts is a fact that we can no longer ignore and the town of Barnstable can choose to capitalize on that use or see others capitalize on it. Thank you, Mr. President. So, Shay, thank you for your uh, introduction and telling the town council um, what I am as far as my background. I'd like to tell you uh, to start right off what I'm not. I think that may be make it a little bit easier for me. I'm not a public speaker. I'm a policeman. So um, sometimes I don't have the greatest grammar in the world. Um, I might not be as articulate as some of the other speakers. Um, some of that may come from uh, being a dad with three children, and I talk to myself a lot, in my house anyway. They don't seem to listen, so when you talk to yourself, you don't get a chance to work on your grammar, you know? Um, I'm not a statistician, I'm not a mathematician, I'm not a clinician. Um, so what I tend to talk to you about today is just uh, common sense perspective of someone that's been in law enforcement for 35 years uh, and is very passionate about this topic, and someone that's been a parent uh, for 27 years. So I want to stay in my lane and talk about police, but I hope uh, the police impact. Uh, but I hope being a, uh, a good policeman makes me a better father, and being a good father makes me a better policeman. Um, I'd like to read into the record here. Um, a statement, a letter from the Massachusetts uh, Chiefs of Police Association. It was crafted in July of 2016 in opposition to the ballot initiative. Although that um, has passed uh, statewide, I think some of the points they raised into it are rather uh, still current, and I'd like to do that with your permission, Mr. President. Uh, for the record, these glasses just make me look more intelligent. I really don't need them. This is from the Massachusetts Chiefs of Police Association. Um, it basically just starts out with, Massachusetts is marred in addiction academic of historic proportions. Now is not the time to increase access to marijuana, marijuana byproducts, and high concentrated T THC. The commercial sale of such potent extracts, including hash oils, resins, and various forms of concentrates that would include marijuana, candy, and beverages containing higher THC levels 
um, can be dangerous. Uh, undesirable impacts taking place in Colorado and Washington State where recent enact enacted laws now allow commercial marijuana sales. Those states have already seen surges in impaired driving, drug driving, drug driving fatalities, and diversion of bulk marijuana to other states, as well as the phenomena of people flocking to those states for the purpose of buying and using drugs. Most alarming, a study recently re released in Colorado shows an increased use of drugs by young people after marijuana was legalized. While traffic fatalities involving drivers under the influence of marijuana and THC have increased in Colorado and Washington, there is no standardized field sobriety test for driving while high, nor is there a scientific standard of measurements for law enforcement to determine impairment. There is no breathalyzer for weed. The proponents would say, would also have you believe that allowing marijuana sales would cut into the profits of organized crime. But that's not happening, that's not what's happening elsewhere. Our colleagues in Colorado have seen drug dealers come from other states to take advantage of the fact that people can now buy pot legally. And given the choice of buying at a store where it's regulated or taxed, or getting on the street where no tax is paid, uh, customers should be, would be attracted to the street level. Uh, many have uh, spoken out in the campaign for safe, healthy Massachusetts. They include Governor Baker, Speaker DeLeo, Mayor Walsh, Attorney General Healy, the Suffolk County Sheriffs, the Retailers Association, the Association of Behavioral Health Care, Massachusetts Hospital Association, Massachusetts Medical Society, the Association of Industries in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents, and all the district attorneys in Massachusetts. Legalization of drugs at this time in our history is a bad idea. There is no benefit or consequence, uh, and the consequences would be dire. With that being said, I'd just like to share uh, some of my own thoughts and uh, words. Um, like I said, I don't, um, I'm not going to quote statistics um, because I think statistics can be in the eye of the beholder. You can find statistics to support any argument, pro or con. Um, I did do a little reading on this. And I read an article from the American College of Pediatricians um, in April of 2017, uh, marijuana use in detrimental uh, to youth. Under the direction of uh, town manager Ells and at the leadership of um, Chief McDonald, the Bonneville Police Department views themselves as uh, guardians and community caretakers. And uh, two of the people most impacted and to be, uh, need our guardianship and community caretaking as our youth and our elderly. Um, specifically our youth, the American College of Pedi Pediatricians says that uh, it would be a grave mistake to uh, legalize it. Unintended exposure to among young people to edibles um, is a problem. Poison control centers calls for accidental pediatric mar marijuana ingestion of triple. Uh, the CDC data indicates that teens are now using marijuana more than cigarette smoke. Marijuana is, uh, in my opinion, without a doubt, a stepping stone, a gateway drug uh, through experimentation. As assistant, I mean, as as District Attorney O'Keefe so, uh, um, was so articulate when he put it that way that, uh, you know, our youth are gonna experiment. Being young, you push boundaries, you know? You start out, you smoke a cigarette, then you drink one beer, then you drink two beers. And then you try marijuana, and you try more marijuana. And uh, where does it lead? I think it leads in the wrong direction. If you've ever tried to rationalize with a young adult and try to explain to them um, the dangers of marijuana, it's, uh, it's legal. Why can't I use it? It's natural. Um, it's a plant. It's legal. Why can't I use it? I, I think you have a hard time when you try to expound on those ideas to someone that's uh, brain is not fully developed. The police department's gonna have a hard time with uh, drug driving. There is no good test for people that are under the influence of uh, marijuana to mix the combination of uh, a moderate use of uh, marijuana and alcohol. Um, that is, yeah, breathalyzer may uh, indicate one thing, but there's no test, breathalyzer test at the police station for uh, currently for marijuana ingestion. In Hyannis, we've come so far in the last past five years uh, trying to find a balancing act uh, between some of the problems we face um, with homeless, Main Street issues, um, Hyannis being um, 
the gateway to the Cape with all our um, medical facilities, our mental health facilities, our social service facilities. And it, we've found a balance right now. There's some great dialogue going out there and people are working uh, together with an increased partnership. I think the introduction to the retail sale um, of marijuana would upset that balance and make it uh, more difficult to manage some of those problems that we already have that we're struggling with currently. I want to stay in my lane and I don't want to argue finances. And um, I'm paid by the taxpayers of the town of Barnesville and I truly appreciate that. And it would be arrogant and disrespectful for me to argue that um, some kind of tax relief to them, benefit to them through some program or through some something to make their life easier wouldn't be worth it. But in this particular case, I believe it is. The city of Lawrence, no one would argue that knows the history of Lawrence or what Lawrence is facing, um, would say that they couldn't use extra revenue. That 17% or 3% or whatever the math says wouldn't benefit that. Lawrence voted it down eight to nothing, eight to zero. Uh, there's my grammar again, nothing. I apologize. That should send a message, a very clear message. They need the money too, but they, were, they recognize the risks that come with that money. As other speakers have said, we're in the middle of an opiate crisis. We're just wrapping our arms around that. Young people are trying to get off opiates in rehab, which is a monumental task. How more difficult are we going to make it when you can walk down to a store and buy marijuana? How, 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 do they, how does that work? How do, how do they process that? How do they get around that? And then there's the licensing issues that, that I, I'm on the Chief's uh, Representative Licensing Authority. We deal with that. Uh, under 21, you're not allowed in a bar. I think we all know from life experience in uh, that people in, uh, under the age of 21, their uh, drive and determination to get around the system, to get into a bar to, to get alcohol or to get bar from a liquor store is monumental. It's gonna be the same with this. Um, I have with me two driver's licenses from the state of Maine. If you look at them, they look real. The only difference you would know that they're not real is you have to run the number. They're from China. They're uh, identical to valid licenses in the state of Maine. They say they're 21 years old. How do we expect that we have a hard time at the bars right now regulating that and the liquor establishment? How are we gonna do that at marijuana establishments? If you go online and Google it, fake IDs, you'll see a litany of things that show up. Fast fake ID, every state listed, sign up. They're coming out of China, and uh, they're very good. And then there's the edibles. We have a real problem uh, sometimes um, with over-service and people getting in cars and driving away, and the bars trying to do their best to regulate who has had too much to drink. How are they going to control if someone has ingested a bunch of edible marijuana and then come into their bar and have one cocktail? How do, how do they know? How do they, how do they figure that out? I think it's, uh, we're making their life a lot more harder, not easier. I think the District Attorney O'Keefe said it very aptly when he said, uh, let's see what happens in other jurisdictions. I'm a very competitive person and I want the town of Bonsville to be the number one in everything. But you know, this might be something we might wanna be number two in. We might wanna see how it plays out. We might want to get the answers to these questions from the police end. Measuring legalized marijuana impact on investigations and crime disorder. What's the impact on police practices? What's the impact on illegal ma marijuana, the black market, the gray market? What's the mar marijuana's effect on the youth, public education, law enforcement challenges? What's the field test? What can we do? Mr. O'Keefe also had a, uh, another great point about good intentions. Hypodermic needles were legalized to stop the spread of AIDS. And that's a, uh, that was a, a great initiative. 
but no one thought about the ripple effect of the legalization of hypodermic needles. Now we have our beaches, our streets, our neighborhoods are littered with needles, and that wasn't the intended consequence. And I'm just fearful of, of what it, the unintended consequences of the legalization of retail sale marijuana will be in the town of Barnstable. Thank you for your time and attention. Good evening, Mr. President, council members. Um, I was in front of this group just a few, uh, actually about two months ago, introducing myself and introducing our group. Uh, first of all, I am uh, a local to Cape Cod, 12th generation Cape Codder, father of two, and I woke up one day last November in a different world, a different world than we're used to, a different world than even most of us can even imagine. A lot of these issues that the district attorney and the good lieutenant have brought up are accurate. The problem is it's happening now. It happened before 2016. It happened, it's been happening. All those controls that we're talking about, all those things that we pride ourselves in, protecting our communities, that's the first and foremost responsibility of any elected officials, protecting the community, and protecting your constituents. It's very simple. We have product, we have a consumer. The only thing you're here to decide is whether the consumer is going to acquire a safe, a tested, and yes, tax product or not. That's it. The consumer is still there. You can't control that. That's now legal. The, pro the, the product is, is going to be available. You can't control that. What you, what, you, what you can't control is the type of product. You can control that. So when I woke up, I said, wow, it's November, it's now legal. How in the world are we gonna grapple with that? How are we actually going to sit and say, well, you know what? Let's actually form uh, a regulatory body to put this together and do something that we did 80 years ago with alcohol. We all, well, not all of us, but many people like to go to the restaurants, have a drink, they like to have a glass of wine at their homes. 80 years ago, that was illegal. Look where we are now. This is my generation's prohibition. We are here to make decisions for the future. But everything I keep on hearing on this panel, with all due respect to everybody, and I do mean that sincerely, is in the past. We need to think ahead. We need to think forward, and we need to think about what life will look like with product that is actually safe tested and yes taxed. And the reason why I say it that way is because first and foremost, we're protecting our citizens by having product that is safe and tested. We can't stop them from consuming it. By the way, we haven't stopped them from consuming it prior. All we're doing here tonight and all we're doing this extended conversation is figuring out the best way to regulate it. And if we ban it, you're banning the only safe product available to the consumer. It's black and white. Yes, it's a very complicated issue, but I just want to peel it back to the most fundamental point. You're only banning the safe access. I don't discount certain things that these folks have said, but let's be realistic about what we're trying to do, what we're trying to accomplish. What you have in front of you are uh, packets. I know we weren't supposed to do, uh, do presentations, so I printed out packets for you. Inside that packet, there's a letter from a gentleman who reached out to us when we formed our group. And his name is Detective Robert Brunn, and he is a retired detective from the Sandwich Police Department. I'd like, uh, Mr. President, if you would allow me to read his letter for the record. He uh, saw the weather report, and he took his wife, and he got out of Dodge last week. So he didn't want to experience this last storm. So he sent us a letter and asked that I read it. Dear Barnstable Counselors, I've been a Cape Cod resident for 46 years, 32 of those I spent as a sandwich police detective, where I served as a school resource officer for five years and a court prosecutor for nine. During that time, I managed the drug evidence which resulted in hundreds of drug prosecutions. I speak from experience when I tell you drugs are rampant on the Cape. 
I've personally seen opioids take hold of our communities and ruin lives. Street dealers are motivated only by money. They often lace their products with substances that they will allow them to charge more, but also get the, the end consumer addicted to harder drugs. My biggest fear, he goes by saying, for cannabis is something acquiring it from these street dealers and it's laced with something that gets people addicted. This may not seem like a mainstream occurrence, but even once is too much. I couldn't agree more. Cannabis isn't killing people. Opioids are killing people. Other drugs are killing people. Hyannis and Yarmouth both have documented instances of street dealers lacing cannabis with fentanyl. I've seen this happen before with ecstasy, and I, and, I, and I see it happening with cannabis now, and it's a big problem. I decided, to I decided to retire after seeing my last suicide by opioids. I cherish my life too much to have to see that on a daily basis. With that said, our community finally has an opportunity to take real control. I've been to Washington, I've gone to Colorado, and one thing I don't see is a pot shop on every corner. There were plenty of facilities, but they weren't just retail, they were all types. Our towns have all the control over what and where, so you can get ahead of this. And if you want one or two storefronts, that's your prerogative. You can regulate it the way you want. Please, counselors, I implore you to take action here and take cannabis away from these street dealers. Legalization is here. It's here. So in my opinion, we have the obligation to ensure citizens have a safe source. Regulate this in a way that benefits Barnstable, takes the control and money away from the street dealers, and invests back in the community, whatever that sum is. I know it's a numbers game. This is me obviously speaking up. Whatever that sum is. You have the opportunity to control what you don't control and won't control if you don't regulate it. The regulations give you the authority and obligation to do what's right. Don't bury your head in the sand and think prohibition will protect our community because it hasn't. Educate yourself with, with education in mind and we are attaching, uh, this is an outline, the documents. If you could please, if you wouldn't mind humoring me, there's a packet underneath that letter. I don't know if you have the folder in front of you. If you don't, that's okay. But it's entitled The Good, Bad, and the Ugly. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what regulation looks like. No one's telling you to use it. No one's telling you to buy it. But that's what safe packaging looks like. I also have some props over here that I'll show you. But this, this is what illegal product looks like. These are the, the gummy bears that we're all seeing and hearing about. This was ordered over a cell phone last week by one of my co-founders. You can order all this list of product today online. There are even companies now that are, are so uh, sophisticated and they don't even mind taking the risk. They'll just mail it to you right now. So when we sit here and we talk about whether or not we should regulate it, the black market has already decided. They're going full board. So in my opinion, it's our responsibility to combat that with regulation, combat that with safe access. Let the consumer, the responsible consumer, decide where they purchase their products. But if you don't give them the option, if you take that option off the table, they have no other choice but to purchase with a black market. I don't have to tell anyone here, growing up in a tourist industry, my parents have a motel we've had for 40 years in Orleans, people are going to come here. They go to Colorado. They're not from here. People are going to experiment with things. And I don't want to be on the wrong side of history here. I just ask, and our group asks, that throughout this process, and I know this is going to be a long process, you keep an open mind, that you look at all these things. And I, I, I would tend to disagree with the district attorney respectfully, I would ask the opposite. You don't have a narrow look, you have a wide look. You look up and you look at the industry as an industry. You educate yourself about not just retail, but you educate yourself about the testing facilities. You educate yourself about the manufacturers, the micro businesses. This is a real industry on the forefront. So there is plenty of other economic opportunity that isn't listed on a PowerPoint right now with a three or a three percent or, or host agreement at attached to it. 
But if you ban the industry, then you'll see none of it. You won't see the host agreements, but you definitely won't see anything of the other types of industries that I just listed. Our group organically has attracted real people, some of them are actually sitting in this room right now, thank you, that want to be on the right side of history. They actually want to represent the industry. When have we ever had a chance, Lieutenant, um, that where you could actually sit next to someone who was actually selling these products and have a conversation with them? You can't right now. They're in the black market. Obviously, there'd be a very quick conversation. But this is a chance to actually have a real human-to-human -human conversation, interaction with people that are part of your community, that have grown up here, that have daytime jobs, that are working double time because they see that they want to be part of the, the socially responsible aspect of this industry. And our group is going to continue to grow and represent Cape Cod in particular because there are plenty of people here who couldn't make it tonight that are working very hard to be part of this new industry and they want to partner with you. You don't have an option to partner with the black market. You don't have an option to have a host agreement with the black market. But the black market will do business without you. But you can actually choose the future and we hope that you make the right choice. Thank you very much. Mr. President and members of the Town Council, thank you very much for having me here tonight. Um, I think that I bring a unique perspective uh, to this topic um, because obviously I'm on the school committee and that is what I'm representing tonight. Um, but uh, I'm also a nurse practitioner here in our community and I have a medical license to prescribe and I certainly see a role for uh, medical marijuana. That's not what's on the table and what's of conversation tonight. But um, I just want you to know that you know my, my views, um, depending on what hat I'm wearing, uh, can differ. Um, I'm also married to a Barnesville police officer, um, so I, I have a, a little bit of an understanding um, of what um, happens um, in our community. Uh, but again, I'm here as, um, as a school committee member, and I promise you that's my strongest voice um, as a school committee member. So. Um, I was kind of uh, writing feverishly a few notes here um, in an effort not to duplicate some of the things that were said uh, tonight. But uh, what I do want to share with you is that um, I did do a, um, a research of some scholarly articles, um, specifically in respect to uh, the effects of cannabis um, on our youth. And uh, I'd like to share a few bullet points with you. Uh, the brain continues to develop from birth through the teen years and into the early 20s. Part of the brain that's developing is the prefrontal cortex. This is area of the brain is associated with weighing, pro, excuse me, weighing pros and cons, impulse control, judgment, and abstract reasoning. Heavy cannabis use can be frequently associated with increased rates of mental illness and cognitive impairment, particularly among our adolescent users. Heavy use of cannabis during the teen years has been shown to drop one's IQ by eight points. Eight points. That's not what we're in the business for in uh, education. Impairment, still, uh, impairment uh, of an adolescent is still evident even one year after cessation of uh, a cannabis product. So, um, in the beginning of the, of the evening, uh, the town attorney had made mention about an ordinance um, in regards to a buffer zone in relation to public schools. Um, and that buffer zone was um, greater than 500 feet. That's walking distance. That's, I mean, that's, it's not okay. If for some reason this town council decides to move forward with this, I implore you to keep it away from our schools and keep it away from our youth. 500 feet is a joke. I would like to echo what um, District Attorney O'Keefe uh, said, please don't expose our vulnerable our youth uh, to marijuana access. 
When we weigh the risks and benefits, the risk to our youth is simply too high. And uh, I'll leave you with this. Uh, you may recall many years ago that there was a public campaign that was focused at our youth uh, that was um, really uh, very evident uh, in the community. The campaign was just say no. And that was around drugs, drug use, et cetera. Marijuana is a drug. I implore you to take that sound advice and just say no. Thank you. All right, thank you to all our panelists. Um, we'll now open the discussion to questions from the counselors or the uh, public, the Board of Health members. Given the complexity of the topic, I would ask that you're mindful of the time and um, do try to be concise so that everyone may be heard. Okay, are there questions you'd like to begin? And um, you could also perhaps um, specify which panelists should you would like to respond to the question. Any questions from counselors? Councilor Rapkosetti. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you on to the panel. Um, I have a question for our town attorney with regards to the medical marijuana zone that we have currently in the town of Barnstable. And I understand we have no medical marijuana facilities located within the town of Barnstable. Could you just tell me where that zone is located? Uh, it's in um, the industrial park in the Attics Way area. I, d I meant to bring the map. I don't have the map, but it's in that part of town. It's in Precinct 1. Um, and I, I can provide a map to the council. I'm sorry, I don't have one in my phone. And uh, did the town of Barnstable receive any applications for medical marijuana? And I know this is not the topic, but I just need a, to lay a little groundwork for myself. It would have probably gone through the de planning and development department. No serious proposals came forward. There might have been inquiries, but nothing came to the point where somebody was, you know, going through the DPH process. Th that process is similar to the CCC process, but so nobody you know, came as, as far as applying for a, a location in Barnstable, as far as I'm aware of. And could you um, also explain to me the costs associated with um, providing retail marijuana sales um, as far as permitting and the process going through DPH um, it's not just the town where they have to apply to. Can you just uh, I highlight? I don't want to speculate on that. I, so somebody might have more information. I know that the fees for um, adult use marijuana are much reduced than they were in the, um, the medical marijuana. That's my understanding. But I don't want to give you false information about that. OK. If I may, may I ask the panelists? Um, let's see. Uh, I guess I wanted to ask uh, the district attorney, um, how, how y you said that no one has gone to jail or you haven't jailed anybody for marijuana. How many people have you jailed for um, alcohol or opiate use, driving or the sale? Um, if you can just. Go make sure the green light's on there. Yeah. Okay, then we'll Those just. Those are two vastly different. To, obviously, every operating under case, uh, because operating under the influence of alcohol, uh, is has a potentially jailable situation. But we have a staircase statutory scheme in Massachusetts, which requires a jail sentence when you reach a certain level of repeated operating under the influence cases. You know, so I, I would say there's, there's probably uh, 20 or 30 people a, a year that face a jail sentence for operating under the influence of alcohol. Um, the rest we try, you know, as the, somebody's first offense for operating under the influence of alcohol, they're entitled, again, to a program, you know, that tries to educate them about the, you know, driving and drinking, et cetera. And so, you know, we have a staircase sort of panoply of penalties based on whether or not somebody gets it. And obviously the person who's 
the third time offender for operating under, they're going to go to jail. Um, are there currently measures being taken since we do uh, um, permit medical marijuana? Are there currently provisions being taken to assess someone's um, being under the influence of medical marijuana? Well, it's it's illegal and would remain but illegal to drive, even under the new sort of recreational marijuana. That's certainly true of medical marijuana. The problem, as I tried to explain, is that there is no correlation scientifically established yet between the amount of THC in your system and its ability to affect your motor skills. We know that 0 0.08 uh, of alcohol in your blood, uh, we, science has told us, and therefore the law has adopted it as the sort of threshold beyond which one can't safely operate a motor vehicle, but we don't have that same testing for marijuana. Is there a test for opiates? No. Okay. No. Um, and if I may, uh, Lieutenant Murphy, thank you. Thank you. Um, you, you mentioned something about um, marijuana being a gateway drug. To what? To other drugs. I believe. Other drugs being what? If you can just, I mean, you have to, from your knowledge, um, <laughs> I just, just am um, curious why you say that's a gateway drug. My life. Because my, from what I've read, um, our heroin epidemic is a direct result from legal drugs, um, from opioids. And I, I'm just wondering where, where the correlation from marijuana, what's next after marijuana? Is it alcohol or, or is it heroin, in your opinion? In my opinion, in my experience, um, specifically dealing with young people, because that's where I was using the reference, um, the opioid epidem epidem epidemic, I apologize again, uh, does not start with heroin. 16 and 15 year old kids are not all of a sudden drug and alcohol free and decide in my experience, I'm not talking about every single case and says, let's try heroin today. They start out in an experimental phase like all young people as we go through life. Let's ride my bike. Let's take the training wheels off the bike. Let's ride my bike down a hill. Let's ride my bike without a helmet. It's a, it's a sequential thing. So I believe that marijuana, as I termed it, as a gateway drug, leads to other experimentation with other narcotics. That's what I believe. Thank you. Ma'am, could I address that, if you don't mind? Anybody who has been in the business that John and I have been in for 30 plus years, anybody who has been in the treatment business, Ray Tomasi, Gosnell, any of the addiction treatment centers, will tell you that marijuana is a gateway drug. And by that, it's meant that the kid who takes a beer and then takes a joint and then takes cocaine and then goes on from there to work his way up to heroin because it's a better high. Uh, that is an experience that is so common to our business. The jail over on the base, more than 85% of the people in there for all kinds of crimes have an addiction problem. And virtually every single one of them, if you look at their criminal record started out smoking marijuana. And Mr. Luzier earlier indicated that it, there's no evidence that it's a gateway drug. The empirical evidence is overwhelming from people who have been in this business dealing with these people. 
But let me give you some scientific evidence. In 2014, in the Journal of Adolescent Medicine, and you can look this up yourself, and I urge you to do that, uh, Yale <coughs> Medical School conducted a study. And uh, in their study, they took a group of uh, people who were now uh, addicted to opiates, pharmaceutical opiates, who then went on to street heroin when the pharmaceutical opiates ran out. And there was a group of people who they were compared with who had never smoked marijuana. So you had people identically uh, afflicted with this opiate issue the group of them that had started out smoking marijuana versus the group that never smoked marijuana. It was determined that Yale Medical School, two and a half times more likely to be unable to get off of the medically prescribed opiate that they were given once they fell off the turnip truck because they had pre-wired their brains the same receptors that THC attach to are the receptors that opiates attach to in the brain. You know, um, look at that research. Uh, Journal of Adolescent Medicine, 2014. Yale reluctantly concluded that those people who have argued that marijuana is a gateway drug, they may be on to something. Yeah, any further questions from the council? Uh, Councilor Tinsley? Thank you very much, and I'm, I'm not quite sure who to direct this to, but I, I think it was um, in the beginning about the, the towns, but because of the, the conversation that's come up, I think, you know, I, I, I the arguments, a lot of the arguments we have heard, uh, being a father, because that keeps coming up, I'm a father of two children, two grown daughters, um, uh, uh, many of the arguments I'm hearing were pertinent before the vote, but that vote has passed. And, and, and my question has to do with how many towns voted no, which I believe someone said was 91 towns voted no. And I just wanted to, because that's what I wrote down in the beginning, was that it was 91 towns. So only those 91 towns can have their board say no. The other... 200 and or the, the the other 260 need to bring it to the vote in November so they uh, so I can't see how a majority have said no yet but but since we brought this up is is in the Washington Post the um, Colorado Department of Health did a random survey of 17,000 high school students middle and high school students in 2015, 21% said they had tried marijuana in the past 30 days, which was actually down from 25% before legalization. So I think it was another individual said, you can take numbers and surveys and do what you want with them, um, but I only bring that up because of the most recent conversation that there is also empirical proof that the usage has gone down since legalization in Colorado. And that's also something anyone can look up. It's in the Washington Post. It was printed by the um, Colorado Department of Health. So, but it, it, that, I brought that up because of the conversation, but it was 91 towns, correct, voted no? Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Councilor Flores. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, combination, really, of a comment and a question. Um, first and foremost, we can all find any report to either support or negate everything that's being said here this evening. <coughs> um, I am a statistician, uh, and I can find anything and manipulate any data to basically say what I want it to say, improve the, the end hypothesis to make sure that it does say what I want to say. Councilor Tinsley just suggested that there's a study that says Colorado doesn't have a problem. I have one here that stated basically October 10th, 2017, uh, the Colorado marijuana use number one in nation among teens and adults. And it goes through a whole potpourri of issues concerned with it. But that's really not the point tonight that I want to focus on. I want to look at this from a policy issue. We have to connect the data points that tell us why it is 
in the best interest of Barnstable as a town to legalize marijuana. That's really the basis of this question. It's the basis of ultimately what we will decide as a council. What is it that's going to be to our advantage to say yes versus saying no? Is it strictly money? Is it the 3% we get out of a host agreement? Is it the 3% that we possibly get out of tax revenue? Well, <coughs> couple with the other industries that might come here at the expense of the arguments that have been made that this does increase drug use down the road. What difference does it make if I buy my pot in Barnstable or I go next door and I buy it in Brewster? I drive there and let Brewster have the worry and the headache about policing it, about monitoring it, and then I drive back to Barnstable. So we have to look at this from a very pragmatic perspective, connect the data points, we as a council, and then ultimately come up with a decision that's going to determine whether I want to have a medical marijuana facility or a recreational marijuana facility in my precinct, which is Precinct 1, which does represent the industrial zone, which overwhelmingly my voters in my precinct voted no. So from a practical perspective, where do we go as the next step? And I ask anyone from, 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 from the, from the uh, resident experts who have been speaking tonight to, to connect those dots for me. Above and beyond money, above and beyond industry, what's the advantage of us putting a facility, which right now is zoned for Precinct 1 in the industrial park in Barnstable? Convince me. Oops, sorry. If I could, um, I'm not going to convince you tonight. Um, I don't think anyone's going to be convinced tonight. But I will say that throughout this process, and it's also in your packet, sorry, I print a lot of paper, um, our group feels strongly for everything that you just said that there should be education behind this, education to every decision. Um, we, our group, would like to officially offer this body and other leadership in, um, on the Cape, but specifically this body. Because unlike the other towns, you're the only town on the Cape that will decide the future of, re of regulated cannabis access. Those other towns will decide via town meeting. So this is, a, this is a very special group. It's also a very special circumstance on the Cape, and it's also probably, in terms of uh, a commercial perspective, the most important town there is on the Cape, let's face it. So we would like to propose a, a, what we like to call a seed to sale tour, where um, on a date of your choosing, we get on a bus and we go to and see and visit different parts of the industry. Not to convince you but to educate you and to give you a different perspective, something that you can't get from your seats tonight, something that you can't get from a laptop, something that you can't get from stats from either side. And look at these businesses and these industries and talk to these leaders and, and gauge to see what you think might fit in your town and also in your precinct. And the only way you can do that is to actually talk to people, to meet people, to collaborate with people. Now you may walk away and say, that's not, that's not for me. But maybe that's not for Precinct 1. Something else is for Precinct 11. So we hope you take our offer seriously. I hope I at least touched on your question, Counselor. Um, and uh, I look forward, hopefully, to be contacted by you so we can actually set that up and, and do something that, quite frankly, hasn't been done in the state at the local level. Groups have gone to other st states. Boston City Council took a, a group to Colorado. We don't have to go to Colorado anymore. We just cross the bridge. That's all we have to do. We can cross the bridge, and we can go look at this industry, and then you can make a decision um, that you think fits your precinct, but also your town. Thank you. Maybe one more comment on that, and we'll move on. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Who's here? So the history of marijuana prohibition is a history of racism, which has created stigma for its users. Uh, the uh, first prohibitionist was uh, the head of the analog of the DEA, Harry Anslinger, who uh, was losing his job uh, as uh, a uh, regulator of alcohol because alcohol became legal. And so he needed to keep his job. So he started demonizing cannabis users, changed the name of cannabis to marijuana because it was a Mexican uh, drug and uh, started uh, really a racist campaign. Um, and the stigma of marijuana use for the 80 years of that 
prohibition has created um, a stigma among users. It's stigmatized. So if you decide that uh, you're going to send the folks who use marijuana in, in the town of Barnstable to Brewster or Plymouth or Bro Brockton, you continue to stigmatize those people. And the, the 80 years of the war on drugs, as we know, has been an abject failure. It hasn't stopped the use of drugs. And so um, you, you will continue to create a group of second-class citizens if, uh, if you decide that you're going to send your, uh, the residents of Barnstable somewhere else to get their marijuana or to the illicit market. Thank you. Okay, one more point, real quick. Okay. Yeah, I think the answer to your question is um, this is a highly regulated industry. And the medical marijuana, uh, they're all, it's all tested. They just uh, find somebody because they found pesticides in a sample. Highly regulated. Uh, an awful lot of oversight by DPH, and there will be over the Cannabis Commission. So the product, they can take THC, uh, they can just eliminate it uh, in a grow facility. So you would have a source of unaltered or better or higher quality or less destructive, if you want to put it that way, product, which doesn't exist now when kids buy this on the street. And then just a little observation, you know, a lot of folks that voted for this were older folks that lived through the 60s and the 70s, where there was a fair amount of kind of crazy activity going on. And uh, I know a number of these folks. And, uh, you know, many of them say, well, I'm not damaged. I mean, look at me. You know, I led a life. I was successful. So, you know, a lot of this is focused on, there, there have always been those that have been challenged by the experience. Uh, and society, you know, starting with, I think, reefer madness, has tried to stop that. Uh, but now through science and technology, they're talking about putting out a cigarette without any nicotine in it. So what you have would be an opportunity for folks that want to engage in this activity, which has been going on for a very long time, an opportunity to be sure that what you are acquiring uh, is a product that isn't going to cause you really serious injury unless you abuse it. Can I respond to that? Well, I still can go to any legal community and still buy that product as opposed to buying it in Barnstable, correct? Right. Uh, carbon dioxide. <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions, counselors? The board. Okay. Councillor Crocker. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. Great job trying to bring to light the issue that we are going to struggle with for some time here. A great group in front of us here, and I'm sure uh, whatever comes will be the best for Barnstable. I would like to ask uh, Andre, William, and Spencer, though, who is applying for licenses? Who are these new vendors that want to come to our town? Can you describe uh, what if the license went out, who might be coming forward from uh, your experience and from your connections? Are they big business? Are they individual people? We've heard about past uh, US, Sen uh, US House of Representatives people trying to get pieces of the pie. We've heard about Holy Cross trying to get pieces of the pie. We've heard every story that's out there. <laughs> so we're a very well-educated group. But who who is chasing licenses? Who is it that we're asking to come set up business in our town if we open the licensing process? There are a whole range of folks. Um, I know uh, there are some folks who belong to an organization called MassCan, um, and they're interested in um, outdoor farming. Um, there's a woman, there's a member who's a member of that group who's, who grows um, her uh, heritage tomatoes, and she wants to uh, start to grow cannabis. Um, she, sh and it will be a, uh, th there, there's an authorization for micro businesses. So anyone who uh, grows uh, a 5,000 square foot canopy or less and, and uh, is a resident of Massachusetts uh, 
can apply for that micro business license. It also authorizes them to process um, cannabis to um, um, make edibles or manufacture whatever they want. But it's a, it's a small business opportunity. Um, there are also uh, several th uh, different, 11 different tiers of cultivation. So it st starts with zero to 5,000, 5,000 to 10,000, and then increases uh, in 10,000 uh, square foot increments uh, up to 100,000 square feet. Um, there are certainly people who are already in the business in other states um, that are coming to Massachusetts and looking to get into the business. There are certainly um, medical marijuana facilities who will be authorized to convert to adult use facilities. So it's a, it's a whole range, and, and uh, there's a group um, that's interested in, in uh, developing uh, craft cooperatives so that they would uh, be um, up to six without more fees, uh, growers um, with no more than 5,000 square foot, foot total that would um, grow craft marijuana like they would uh, brew craft beer. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's no, I'm meeting, with, <laughs> I'm meeting with a guy tomorrow morning who's got three uh, dispensaries in, Cal in Nevada and uh, one, of, one of the only ones on the strip and he also has a 55,000 foot grows facility. He's interested in coming to Massachusetts. So, um, you know, it's, th there's no good profile. Um, everyone from a very small business up to mega businesses. Okay, thank you. Do you want to add something, Spencer? Yeah, uh, if I could, we actually have someone here behind me. If, if she doesn't let me point, Michelle. There's Michelle. Michelle, um, in her day job as a mother, but also as a, uh, has a tree company. I think she's been very busy these past few weeks. Um, she, in her in her spare time, uh, is so passionate about organic, non-GMO edibles, also for medical, but in general, that she is she is someone who would come to your town. She is someone who would want her products sold here, and she is someone who would stand in front of her product and say, "This is my product. This is my story, and this is who I am." So really just a couple with, with what Will was saying is it goes from, yes, large but to small and to truly organic, truly local, and quite frankly, being a Cape Codder, in my mind, and this is why we're regulate Cape Cod, not regulate Massachusetts, is that if we look first locally, I think you'll find there are plenty of partners already here that would like to come to the table and meet with you. And in my mind, if I was sitting in your seat, I would want to talk to those folks first. Thank you. Henry, anything to add? Uh, it's a big business, you know, certainly outside of here. So you'll get a lot of small folks. You'll have the boutiques, but, you know, some folks that I've dealt with have been purchased by, uh, you know, business out of Colorado, Chicago. Um, there are folks out there with market caps of over a billion. Monsanto's interested in the business. So depending on how robust it is, and there's an enormous potential considering what Massachusetts is for it to be robust, uh, what you see now is maybe not what you'll see in five years because this industry will consolidate, it'll get more efficient. You will have the boutiques for you know high-end specialty kinds of things that are done a certain way. But in general, I think you, know, you have cappies down here now. So you know, you get big businesses that come in and say there's a market here and let's go after it. So, you know, it'll change over time. But I think what many folks have seen in, in the beginning is sort of local folks with an interest um, uh, to bring this forward that can reassure the community that, you know, they're one of them. And over time, you know, that has the potential to evolve. Thank you. I think we perhaps have time for one or two more questions. <laughs> Councilor Lebeck. I guess this uh, question would be for District Attorney O'Keefe. <clears throat> In um, places like Colorado, has there been any record or I guess how has it been navigated that the, of the prosecution of those, uh, is there any s statistics um, or uh, result of the legal legalization of marijuana of police officers being in arresting people for being under the influence of marijuana? Um, you know, as the 
Councilor from Precinct One suggested, and I think Will Rogers said it, you know, first. There are liars, damn liars, and then there are statistics. So right, right. you can get, you know, a set of data to say virtually anything you want. That's why, you know, I've tried to say tonight, look at this stuff yourself. Right. You know, it's go online yourself, decide whether you want to believe the medical community and you know, you, you, you look at who's representing themselves to be the medical community and what they're saying about this. Mass Hospital Association, the American Medical Society, the, you know, uh, so you, you look at that, you weigh that. It, you go on to Colorado, the high intensity drug trafficking area of the West, mm -hmm. and you go on their data and you look at their arrests and what they're for and who the demographic is, from kids all the way to the uh, Russian cartels that have come into Colorado, to the Cuban cartels that have come into Colorado to mix in with the, with the so-called legal stuff. And you know, uh, you, you look at that high intensity drug trafficking area in the West from the Department of Justice and you make a decision about what you believe. Uh, I just wanna address one other thing and then I'll, you know, uh, Spencer Knowles, uh, you know, suggested to you that somehow you're going to, uh, if, you, if you say you bring this in and you've regulated and all that, that you're going to eliminate the black market. That's nonsense. The one group that can't buy this stuff in the legal market are kids. And that's where the black market is going to go. And just think about it. If you're, you know, the drug kid on the street who wants to get some marijuana, um, or even the young adult, the 22, 23, 24, 25 year old, are, are you gonna go and pay taxes on this stuff or are you gonna get it from the kid on the corner? Uh, to, it's, you know, you, you look at the data from Colorado and you ask yourself the question, did they eliminate the black market? No, they didn't. Um, you know, the, the, um, the pernicious nature of this, again, relates to kids. You know, I don't care if adults smoke this stuff, but you've got to make a, a judgment about whether this is a good thing to introduce to the youth of Barnstable because you're going to increase the marijuana. The one thing that the principal and the superintendent of the Denver school system said when they were, you know, the, these arguments about we're going to be, you know, sharing revenue and we're going to build new ball fields for the schools and everything else. The one thing the superintendent said that the only thing that the legalization of marijuana has brought to the Denver school system is more marijuana. Thank you. Additional questions? For Councilor Herb Hebert. Thank you very much. Uh, this question, I, I'm going to direct mostly to Stephanie. Uh, Ellis, because of your background, because of your uh, nurse practitioner, and you've worked with you. Um, my concern is, and you, you mentioned that marijuana use um, can, for a young person, uh, contribute to some mental illness. I have seen it firsthand more times than I, than I care to think about. Um, but my other concern is, since I'm the one that's trying to get the nips uh, under control in our town, is if somebody is smoking a joint and then uh, consuming one or two nips, uh, any, f any alcohol, what would be the, um, the impact on that individual in their capacity to think and their capacity to function? Okay, Especially so with a youth. Sure, so I, um, I'll put on my nursing cap and, um, and dig into my experience. Both um, marijuana and alcohol have sedating effects, so you're gonna compound any sedating effect you may have with any chemical you may start with. Um, I can tell you from, um, from my practice, uh, from a prescribing perspective, uh, we screen our patients the best we can. Um, I work uh, in a surgical uh, area with my nurse practitioner license um, and we therefore, uh, we prescribe opiates in order to help with surgical pain for a short period of time. We will not prescribe opiates to someone who uses uh, mar marijuana uh, on a regular basis. Uh, we will find some kind of alternative 
um, being uh, steroids, injections, whatever it may be, but um, I, we will not prescribe because very similar to alcohol, opiates also um, have sedating effects and uh, it's, you know, it's just simply dangerous. And um, there's just, there's, you know, certainly, um, you know, you would be impaired in um, all judgment as far as, uh, you know, operating a motor vehicle, um, you know, making day-to-day uh, uh, -day decisions. Okay. Thank you. I think um, that's it. Any other questions? Or if okay, one more. Riverside. Thank you. Um, this is for Mark Milne. Um, I know uh, your PowerPoint was not up to speed, but does the town get any tax revenue from the sale of alcohol? The town of Barnstable. And there was mention in this 138 alcohol uh, licenses. Do we get any money from that? No, not directly. No. So all the tax, the alcohol tax, goes to the general fund of the state of Massachusetts. Correct. Yet we spend an awful lot of time, and I would say that Lieutenant Murphy and uh, District Attorney O'Keefe spend a lot of their efforts um, with alcohol-related uh, problems. So nothing, we get nothing. So we have the opportunity, to, if we do allow this, to get at least 3%, but possibly 6%. If this is an all cash business, how is that? How is that determined? Who determines that? Um, you know, they have cash receipts. How do we capture that money? Um, it's a good question, and it's something that we're going to have to learn how to do um, in working with the state officials to figure out uh, how that is done. Because I think, as somebody mentioned. Um, you know, it is against the federal law still, and there's issues regarding cash being um, um, funneled through banks uh, from such a type of business. So uh, I don't have all the answers as to what, um, how those transactions will take place tonight, um, but that will be something we are going to have to explore to figure out just how we get it actually into our treasury. And if we do decide to accept that money, um, could we be in jeopardy if we use it for certain things? Could we be in jeopardy of not receiving federal uh, grants for programs because we're using uh, um, tax revenue from an illegal substance? I have not heard that. Okay. All right. I think that information will be something that will be needed. Thank you. Or we just want to make sure. Does the Board of Health have any questions? I I have a question. Uh, I understand that all everyone saying that the marijuana is very dangerous. Sound like very very dangerous in the town. How come uh, that, that we are trying to release the, to the people? Can we just vote to do not use marijuana in the uh, town of Bansabo? Can we do this or no? Not allowed. Because it's regularized, we have to sell it. That's, uh, that's why we're talking about? No, the town attorney started the meeting off. I know you came in a little bit late, but the um, maybe Ruth wants to come up and explain it one more time quickly. I don't want to misspeak on her behalf. Thank you. There is a process to vote to ban all me medical marijuana establishments. Um, no, all, all medical marijuana establishments. It, that whole list that we talked about earlier, you can just do a complete prohibition. Um, not medical, no, all retail. You're right, all retail, not medical. Medical marijuana is un unaffected. I, I'm sorry, I misspoke. But there's personal use, which is which we cannot regulate, um, and that it was that is not regulated by the town. But we can ban all um, all adult use um, medical. I'm sorry, adult use establishment. Adult medical. use means uh, recreational use. Recreational use. 
in recreational use. It's, it's retail sale of it. Retail sale. The retail sale of it. We can ban. So we could ban. Right. We can. We can. But not by whom? It is by this Council, body. Council. Right. So you have a power to stop this. Why don't we stop this? This is part of the process to start a discussion. Okay. So we are discussing to maybe we, can, we could stop all, all this situation. It's still personal use, which we cannot okay. regulate. And there's a, uh, the number of plants you can grow. And so there is personal use, which cannot be regulated. Okay. Um, it's not the sale, but it is the um, medical marijuana adult use establishments. Can so be in other words, retail business, we could say, do not do that. We can say that. Here. Oh, great. Thank you. So, thank you. Okay. Um, so, I think uh, we'll conclude the question and answer session. Uh, President Steinhilber, I'm turning the meeting back over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Maureen. I appreciate um, you being here tonight, and special thank you to all of the panelists. Uh, your opinion is very much uh, valued, and I appreciate you taking the time uh, to come in and uh, present and answer questions tonight. Uh, to help educate the council here as we you know, continue our discussion and make a decision one way or another. Um, I want to thank our town attorney and our finance director as well for kind of giving us an overview of the structure here within the state uh, as this has been a, an evolving thing uh, since it was passed in 2016. Um, in order to kind of keep this discussion moving uh, as we go forward from here um, and out of uh, respect for uh, the voters of Barnstable and the result we had here. And as president, I am at the first meeting in June going to bring forward an item to ban the retail sales. Um, and if any other counselor or counselors uh, wish to write up an item uh, to do the opposite, to start the process to allow retail sales, please do so. And we will take that up. We will put it on the agenda and we will take that up first. So with that, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. All those in favor? And we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.